All right, so just starting out with our pulsars and neutron stars. Um, this entire story starts with this uh, graduate student named Jocelyn Bell, now Jocelyn Bell Burnell, in Cambridge, UK. And so here's Jocelyn Bell standing in front of a, a radio telescope out in Cambridge. And this is a signal, an example of the type of data that she was taking. I think this was in the 1960s. Um, and so all of the data that was collected by this radio telescope was printed out onto this like long continuous scroll of paper. So here's her um, holding her scroll. That's probably this exact same piece that I'm looking at in this picture. And um, the signal here is plotted in red. And essentially what they're looking for is little wiggles, little pulses that are different from the background noise. And so this is the first detection, this particular piece of data of Pulsar CP1919. And uh, this was called by Jocelyn, the little green men signal, because it seemed like possibly, you know, such a regular timed signal um, must be due to extraterrestrial life. She didn't actually think that it was, you know, tongue in cheek. So anyway, this is the story of the pulsar. So there had to be some rational explanation for this weird radio signal. Um, to give you an idea of how regularly timed it was, this happened every 1.33728 seconds. They would get another spike of radio emissions or radio, sorry, collection. Um, so this was the discovery of the pulsar. Uh, and unfortunately, Jocelyn Bell did not receive the Nobel Prize for this. Uh, she was a graduate student at the time, so her advisor received the Nobel Prize. This data, I took a picture of it when I was in Cambridge a couple summers back. I just thought this was the coolest thing that you could actually see the, you know, the data. All right, so what is a pulsar anyway? Why does it produce this regularly timed pulse of radio? Um, well, they are uh, pulses of radio signals that we receive from pulsars range from uh, one thousandth of a second to 10 seconds long. And a lot of the times when we see these radio signals, they don't correspond to any visible light in space. So it's as if you're looking out into a blank void and you see radio signals coming from that location at regular timing. Um, it seems like a very strange thing to expect. Oops, let me, there we go. So um, it just so happened that we did identify a pulsar in the Crab Nebula, and that was the detection that made astronomers start to wonder, maybe these are related to dead and dying stars. Uh, the Crab Nebula's pulsar is very quick. It sends 30 seconds, uh, a pulse 30 seconds every second, or sorry, 30 times every second, can't talk this morning. So this is a very fast period pulsar. So since we know that these supernova remnants like the Crab Nebula are associated with either neutron stars or black holes, then the question was, well, maybe pulsars are actually related to neutron stars. Maybe in fact, they are neutron stars. So reviewing neutron stars, uh, we talked about neutron stars last time um, as the core of a high mass star contracts and presses past the electron degeneracy pressure that holds up a white dwarf star, then the protons and electrons get squeezed together in a process called neutronization and everything left in that star's core becomes neutron or a neutrino. The neutrinos stream out and cause the supernova explosion and the neutron star is what remains. Um, it is much smaller than a white dwarf star because it has pressed past that uh, white dwarf size. So whereas a white dwarf star is around the size of planet Earth, the neutron star is around the size of a city. So here I've drawn it on top of Eugene. Um, it would fit easily between Fern Ridge and Mount Pisgah. The mass of a neutron star is um, within a specific range because if it's less than 1.4 times the mass of the sun, then it'll just be a white dwarf star. But if it's greater than three times the mass of the sun, it'll become a black hole. And so putting this amount of mass into such a small object means that they are at very high densities. And in fact, they have about the same density as an atomic nucleus because it's basically made of just neutrons packed closely together. That's exactly what atomic nuclei are. Uh, 
except with some protons in there. So for a sense of scale, if you had like a thimble full of neutron star, that would weigh as much as a normal sized mountain, not a Mount Everest mountain, but like a Mount Hood. So neutron stars, pretty extreme. And these extreme properties lead to other extreme properties. So my question for you is, um, what do you think is not one of those extreme properties? And that is a, that they fuse neutrons at high temperatures. So there's no fusion happening within neutron stars, just like there's no fusion happening within white dwarfs. They are over fusion. It is not happening anymore. Um, there's nothing left to fuse because there's no more nuclei, only neutrons. So all these other things are true. All these other extreme properties are happening. Neutron stars are definitely more dense than white dwarfs. They have a higher amount of mass squeezed into a smaller volume. Um, they rotate extremely rapidly and they have very strong magnetic fields. And these two latter um, attributes are what causes them to generate a pulsar signal. So let me go ahead and walk through exactly what's happening there. Um, so because they have a some sort of you know, spin initially, right? Our sun rotates, then as they shrink, that their spin speed becomes higher and higher. So this is the reason, oops, that they have very fast rotation. It's basically a, a similar to a figure skater. If they start out with any amount of spin and then they contract into a smaller size, then they spin faster and faster. Okay, so that's what's happening to our uh, neutron star. As it shrinks, it spins faster and faster and it uh, generates a very strong magnetic field. So uh, the, the magnetic field shape is the same as the shape of a magnetic field on earth or the sun or any other object that has a, a field. Um, but with one major difference, which is that usually um, earth's magnetic field the magnetic poles are very close to the rotation poles. And this is not the case for the neutron stars. They can have a magnetic field that's offset from their rotation axis. And so um, this is what, why uh, we receive pulsar signals in the way we do, because they have these two beams of particles and radiation that emanate from their magnetic poles. And because that's offset from their rotation axis, then it's like you have a flashlight that you're swinging around. Um, sometimes you see you know, the beam as it passes you. If it was just on the rotation axis, and so the, the beams emitted directly along the rotation axis, um, then that rotation axis would have to be pointed directly at you for you to ever measure the pulses of radio signal from, the, from these beams. Um, but since they're offset, we're likely to see more pulsars than we would otherwise. So the analogy here is that it's like a lighthouse. So a lighthouse has a mirror that spins or a lens that spins at its top and sends out a regularly pulsed signal uh, so that ships can see it at, in the ocean. Um, and for the pulsar, if we happen to be aligned with these beams, then we see the pulsar. But for example, if Earth was not in this plane here, but was instead here above the rotation axis, um, we wouldn't see those beams. So it's likely that all neutron stars are pulsars, at least early in their, I guess, afterlives. Um, but it's not true that all pulsar, or sorry, that all pulsars are visible to us. So there's probably many pulsars out there, but we don't see all of them uh, because of this misalignment. Okay, so um, I told you that the Crab Nebula pulsar sends out 30 pulses every second, which is pretty fast. And so I want you to just start thinking about what do you think is the difference between the timing? What do you think that timing difference actually means? So compared to a pulsar with a one second period, what would you say is true of a pulsar with a 100 second period? Okay, yeah, I'm seeing most votes for A. If a pulsar has a longer period, that means that it's rotating slower. So if we receive pulses spaced out over more time, then that's a longer period. Um, the period is the time between pulses. So it must be rotating slower if that's the case. 
And this happens for older uh, pulsars. They slow down over time until they no longer um, emit those beams that we see. So um, this is related to the energy that they are losing over time. So um, there's different kinds of energy. One of them that we've talked about before is the energy of a moving um, atom, right? Some the atoms in order to fuse in the core of a star have to be moving at high speeds. That's called kinetic energy. There's a similar type of energy of motion called rotational energy. And because a neutron star is a very massive object with a very fast rotation, it has a very high rotational energy. But this is lost over time and it has to go somewhere because energy is conserved. So this is related to why um, supernova remnants like the Crab Nebula glow. The idea is that the high energy particles from the pulsar beam um, and also the strong magnetic fields around the pulsar cause the surrounding gases in the supernova remnant to glow. And so that energy is being transferred ultimately from the rotational energy of that um, star to the glow of the gas. And over time, enough of this energy is actually lost that this, the rotation speed has to slow down. So this is effectively what's happening. Um, the rotational speed lost by the pulsar, the, the total energy of that is equal to the energy that is emerging as luminosity from the supernova remnant. Um, that can actually be, be very precisely measured. And indeed that it has been precisely measured for the Crab Nebula in particular. And it's why we know that for sure, pulsars are related to no neutron stars and power these supernova remnants. All right. So over time, their periods will decrease and that will cause the super remnant a supernova remnant to stop glowing. Okay, uh oh. I meant to have this as a discussion question, but I did not put the boxes here animated. So anyway, um, there are a few reasons we don't see lots of pulsars in the Milky Way. I already told you one of them, which is that some of them might not be oriented so that we actually see those lighthouse beams. They might be missing us, even though they're pulsars. And also some, sometimes they can slow down and if they no longer have the energy to produce beams, then we won't see them anymore. Um, I don't think your book mentions this, but neutron stars were actually predicted theoretically before they were ever observed as pulsars, which I think is pretty cool because in order to calculate the properties of a uh, neutron star, you have to be, have a good model of stellar evolution. Um, and it's worth mentioning also, there's lots of other kind of exotic star types out there that are theoretical. Um, and it's possible that someday we will detect some of these, even though we cannot right now. So if you're curious on looking into more of these, um, just look for exotic stars on Wikipedia and you'll find like all kinds of stuff. 